This is Twit. There's a big question that's been brewing lately, and it's becoming a legal necessity to have an answer of this. And the question is, is Bitcoin money? It's an important question. For example, the IRS says it's property, not currency. And of course, they would say that Bitcoin is property and not currency because if it's property, they can tax it. And it turns out that Ross Ulbricht, the alleged creator of the Silk Road online black market, agrees with the IRS, according to a new article on Forbes.com by Andrew Greenberg. You see, Silk Road used Bitcoin as a method of payment, and Ulbricht is charged with, among other things, money laundering. He says that if Bitcoin isn't money, then how can there be money laundering? It's an interesting point. Uh, with, with us to explain all of this is Andrew Greenberg himself, and uh, I want to welcome you, Andrew. Thanks for having me on, Mike. First, can you tell us what Silk Road is uh, briefly and, and what is this case all about? Well, Silk Road was a black market anonymous website that sold essentially any kind of contraband that you can imagine, or rather limited to victimless contraband, things like narcotics and counterfeit documents. Um, and it, w it was a thriving black market business that did something like $1.2 billion of sales before it was shut down in October of last year. And it, it, all of these sales happened exclusively in Bitcoin. Uh, and then, of course, the site was seized by the FBI and its owner, uh, allegedly this 29-year-old kid named Ross Ulbricht, was arrested in San Francisco. Now, do you think the claim that Bitcoin isn't a currency, do you think that's a sound legal strategy? Are they going to get anywhere with that? Well, it's interesting. I think, you know, this is just a motion to dismiss all charges. It's not really, the trial hasn't started yet. The trial starts in November. And this is really just the first hint that we've seen of the strategy of, of uh, Ross Ulbricht's lawyer, Joshua Dreitel, who was a very accomplished uh, defense lawyer who has taken on lots of terrorist cases, in fact, very high profile, complicated cases. <clears throat> and we can see that he's really, I think he's just trying every argument uh, he can think of. The Bitcoin argument is maybe the most controversial and the one that will have you know, the, 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 the most wide reaching effects for the rest of the Bitcoin economy. Uh, it's very clever, you know, following just days after the IRS's announcement that Bitcoin is not currency, that it's property, he's turned around and said, well, if it's not currency, then how can it be used in money laundering? And the court will have to contend with that before it even begins to address the actual prosecutor's accusations about the, uh, the alleged administrator of this black market site. So, Andy, if, if um, you know, the IRS says that Bitcoin is not money and uh, federal law enforcement is partly charged with going after money laundering, does that create tension between different uh, agencies with different jurisdictions? Yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, it's, it does seem like this is kind of uh, a problem, in fact, a gap in money laundering regulations. And they will have to probably be changed in some way to include this idea of digital property being used for money laundering. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know all the details of money laundering law, but um, Joshua Dreitel, the lawyer in this case, cites a New York Law Journal article that has that pointed out actually two months ago that this is a, a problem for money laundering regulations, and it comes uh, just as New York financial regulators are trying to implement money laundering regulations about Bitcoin. So uh, I, I think that in, in the process of creating something like a bit license, which seems like it's going to come for Bitcoin based businesses, they're also going to have to potentially amend money laundering laws themselves to deal with this new idea of a digital property or a digital currency that can be used for potential money laundering applications. Now, Andrew, the, the Bitcoin question is kind of uh, a little bit on the periphery. The main argument, as I understand it, is similar to the one that Kim.com is using in the mega upload case, probably one that Pirate Bay people use, which is this whole question of when you have a platform where things happen that are illegal, is the person who provides the platform liable for that activity? And I think, as I understand it, this is this is his central case, which is that he just provided the platform and all this drug uh, sales and all that kind of stuff was just happened by users. Is that is that right, uh, yeah. correct? Now, is that... It is is that is that something? Do you think is a is a good strategy? Is that gonna you know are, do the facts uh, point to that being the case? Well, it's interesting. The um, you know it, it's there are actually two different laws when we're talking about copyright cases like Kim.com's case. That's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has this safe harbor for you know uh, unintentional infringements of, of you know users doing copyright infringing things. In, in the case of the Silk Road, Joshua Dreitel is arguing that. Uh, 
it should be protected by the Communications Decency Act. Uh, Section 230 creates another kind of safe harbor for other, you know, for actual uh, illegal activity that happens on a website, not just copyright infringement, but in this case, something like the sale of cocaine or heroin. Uh, and it's true that, that the Silk Road is not like Amazon. It's much more like eBay. It's a, it hosts third-party sellers. So the, uh, the administrator of the site, if it is Ross Ulbricht, he, even if he was running the website, it's not, that doesn't necessarily follow that he was selling drugs himself. He was kind of facilitating uh, the, sale, the sale by drugs of, of, of drugs by other people. And another law that Joshua Dreytel, the lawyer in this case, cites is what's known as the crack house statute, which is a separate drug law that applies to someone who owns a, a crack house, essentially a place where drugs are used and or manufactured or sold. And it's a different law than someone who possesses drugs or uses drugs or just sells drugs. So uh, he argues, the lawyer in this case, that, that because the crack house statute exists, that shows that the laws that are currently being used to go after the administrator of the Silk Road uh, don't apply that they should be using this crack house, stat crack house statute instead, which actually has much smaller penalties, but uh, actually wasn't even used by prosecutors at all in the indictment. So he's he's sort of pointing to an inconsistency here. It, it runs to a theme uh, that that the law is not up to date with the realities of today. They're essentially uh, accusing them of money laundering and and talking about crack houses and he's living everything is virtual it's bitcoin right, and yeah. it's not a house it's a you know it's a website so it's all it's all sort of uh virtual and in the cloud well andrew i want to thank you for coming on tech news today and and uh giving us your insights into this case well that was great thanks for having me thank you you can find andrew at forbes.com and also on twitter at a underscore greenberg